So we have three amazing guests today. We have Vera Buhlmann, we have Michael Doyle, and we have Philip Morel. And our first speaker for today will be Michael Doyle from the Université Laval in Canada. Michael R. Doyle is an assistant professor at the Université Laval School of Architecture in the Faculty of Planning, Architecture, Art, and Design. His main research and teaching interests revolve around an information theoretic understanding of the person and the milieu, computational techniques of abstraction in the articulation of architectural artifacts, including big data and machine learning, and the interplay of mediacy and immediacy in perception and action in the built environment. With the support of FRQSC, he launched in the summer of 2023 a new project, Masks of the Genius Lotzi, which will build an algorithmic instrument for characterizing streets on the scale of the planet. Prior to joining the faculty of the Laval School of Architecture in 2019, Michael worked as a researcher and lecturer at the Department for Architectural Theory and the Philosophy of Techniques at the TU Wien in Austria, in Vienna, with whom he published um, an edited volume, uh, Ghosts of Transparency, in 2019. His PhD work, uh, which combined philosophy, geology, architecture, urbanism, and spatial econometrics, was conducted as part of the Deep City Project at the Laboratory for Environmental and Urban Economics at the Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne, in Switzerland. It's my pleasure to welcome Michael R. Doyle as our first speaker. Thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Also, thank you uh, to uh, Carla and Adil and uh, Lee, Lee, Lee Su for the invitation to come speak at the um, Playing Model second edition. Um, as Nicola mentioned in the introduction, I do do some work with, um, uh, in my research work, I'm working on, uh, I'm working with uh, big data sets and uh, machine learning. I will be talking a little bit less about that today. I sort of picked up, I think, partially the, the storytelling keyword of the, the invitation to the conference. Although the questions of the relationship with technology and how we can try to think uh, in a sort of proportionality relative to uh, how technology allows us to see and experience the world is definitely something that filters back into my teaching activities and, not, and isn't just directly um, addressed in my um, research work. So I teach at the three levels uh, in our university, bachelor's, master's, and the PhD program. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a bachelor studio and a um, master's level elective course, which I'll introduce both. So uh, there are some questions that I've been formulating and reformulating that uh, traverse my teaching activities. And they are the following. How can one find one's stance in the stances of others? How can we learn to inhabit those stances when learning to stand firmly on our own? For architects, this question is not only about a stance that is articulated through speech, it is also about how the stance finds an external embodiment in the architecture project, and about how buildings are already an, ar an architectonic body that we can learn to inhabit not only literally, but figuratively through imitation. In the following, I will present the work of two courses I gave at Laval University, Verdsus, Auberge des Lieutenants, uh, a third year bachelor level course and, uh, that I gave in 2021, and another one, a master's elective course called Une Maison, Ses Voix et Ses Visages. And I will translate as we go along when it's necessary. This, this was from 2022. The Verdsus studio came about uh, through an initiative of the Montreal-based architecture firm Neuf Architectes, who uh, were looking to support a collaborative architecture studio led by the three architecture schools of the province of Quebec, that is, Université Laval, Université de Montréal, and McGill University. Nick Luca from McGill, Alice Kovata from the University of Montreal, and I agreed to work on a small Swedish town called Nifsta, uh, situated halfway between Stockholm and Uppsala. Uh, each studio was allowed to frame it's uh, angle differently, but we shared a common question of what we architects could offer to a small Swedish town that because of the pandemic at the time, we would not be able to see in person. So here is the story of uh, the Veldsu studio. The Swedish town of Nifsta has rebranded itself as the place where the future lives. 
formulated in Swedish as Der Framtidenbor. Investment in housing projects means that the new residents will flock to this town, situated about 50, meter, 50 kilometer, kilometers north of Stockholm and 20 kilometers south of Uppsala off the E4 motorway. It does not expect the future to arrive tomorrow, but it expects an increase in visitors to the town, curious to see the place where the future has chosen to call home. The authorities estimate that they will need to build several new inns, or Veldshus, in, uh, in order to accommodate those passing through. Like the Germanic guest house, the Swedish Veldshus has facilities similar to a hotel, but acts also as a social hub for encounters between the local residents and the visitors. The word Veldshus translates in English to inn, and in French as auberge, in French as auberge. The word verde is a Swedish word for host that could be translated in English as ward or warden and in French as gardien. Less surprisingly, the word hus translates to both building and house, just as in French it can mean edifice or maison. Who can know the future? Nista called upon six possible innkeepers whom they thought might have an in with the future. Hermes, an immortal figure of the family of angels, his model, I communicate, therefore I am. The great fetish of uncertain sex and whose nationality is terrestrial. Their job is to be an idol, the motto of this child of nature and culture, I fascinate you while you fashion me. The hominescent, first name Adam, trained in microbiology and of Western nationality. His motto, the human is a being of the possible. Thumbelina, or Petite Poussette, the 13-year-old daughter of Hermes, also of the family of angels. She is in the, she is in the now of the world and the world unfolds through the screen in her hands. Her motto, behold what's now at hand, holding the world in my hand. Or in French, maintenant, tenant en main le monde. The récitant, or the storyteller, he's a surveyor and a paleoanthropologist. Jules Verne is a distant cousin. His motto, his motto, knowing is remembering, and knowing is knowing how to recount. Recounting is knowing. Our sixth innkeeper, the instructed third, or the tiers instruit, or troubadour of knowledge. They're a hermaphrodite and an educator of mixed origins born of miscegenation. They insist that to learn is accepting that one can also become what one is not. Their motto, we must accept to unlearn what we already know if we want to find what we do not yet know. We tried to meet with the innkeepers, but we received, but all we received were cryptic answers. ID cards with a brief summary provided by, by a Frenchman from the Garonne. We responded, thank you, but this is not you. These are classifications to which you belong. None of this tells us exactly who you are and the kind of inn you would keep. So we asked them to tell us a little bit about themselves. And what we got back were thousands, well, hundreds <laughs> of answers pulled randomly from texts by the Frenchmen in which the name of each was mentioned at least once, but whose original context was unknown to us. From these texts, we tried to decipher how the innkeeper's persona could help us help them be good guests of the city of Nista. This raised the question of what does it mean to be a good guest? What does one do when they are invited to someone else's house? Do they bring something that will say, here's a solution to all those problems that you have, some of them you didn't even know you had? How would this be interpreted by the host? We did not want to inadvertently tell the residents of Nivsta how they should live, and we did not want to put the innkeepers in the position of having to explain why the architects thought they knew best. We didn't know what could be polite to say at the tables of the, inn, of the innkeepers' hosts. While we worked on piecing together the personas of the innkeepers on imagining the kind of inn they might like to keep in Nivsta, we tried to understand Nivsta itself. Of course, we understood that not, by not traveling to Nivsta, we wouldn't be able to plunge into any kind of empathic relationship with its streets or its daily rituals. Instead, we used the site analysis as a conceptual bridge between Quebec City and Nivsta. What was happening in Nivsta when the French were fortifying their settlement overlooking the St. Lawrence River in the early 1600s? How did the mass adoption of the automobile affect patterns of settlement there like, as, it did, as it did here, here in Quebec City? What is it like in the winter? Quebec City may be cold and receive a lot of snow, but it is, at the same time, it is at the same latitude as Zurich and is relatively sunny in the winter. Nivsta, we discovered, is at the same latitude as the city of Kujuac in the northern Quebec region of Nunavik. We also observed similar patterns in the way commercial activities clustered around important intersections. Residential areas tend to hide on quieter, less frequented streets and have a more articulate landscape screening the houses from the street than what we were observing in Quebec City. We saw this in, the, in our uh, typological analysis. Unlike Quebec, which is a provincial capital of more than 500,000 people, buildings combining residential and commercial were relatively rare in Nista. 
Although Nista has only 20,000 people, parking spaces are fewer than towns of similar populations we were familiar with. Where Quebec City is marked by its topography, which divides it into an upper and lower town, Nista is characterized by a landscape of rolling hills. People arriving by train debark at the station in the city center. A local bus system provides a connection to the different residential areas, even though the average walking time from one end of Nista to the other is about 40 minutes. In Quebec City, the rail station is much less a center, much less a hub. Most of the centers in Quebec City, like a lot of North American cities, organize around automobile access. To avoid proposing inns that despite uh, the, all their ingenuity and fantasy might be unfeasible as a construction project, we built up a repertory of tectonic references pulled from the database of the German Review Detail. Even if we like that we like Scandinavian design or we don't like that we like IKEA, simply copying the vernacular seemed inadequate if we were, to, if we were anticipating the arrival of the future. Stockholm's Villa Schellhagen, designed by Swedish architects Christer Björström and Bertolt Broden in the late 80s and early 90s, provided a scalar referent for an idea about the building program and the dimensions of its rooms. We were less interested in the aesthetics of the place than the types of rooms, the number of each type, and their relative proportions. Unlike the Villa Schellhagen, it was not our objective to provide multi-purpose re reception halls or dining rooms. We asked what kind of place for locals and visitors to gather would we find in the inn of the Hamanescent or of the Great Fetish or of Thumbelina. Once we had an idea of the sort of place this would be, we needed to understand the kinds of rooms that we would need. We looked at architectural references on Arc Daily, transforming the geometry of their plans into a topology of spatial adjacencies. With this initial hunt and analysis behind us, the challenge for future architects, the students that is, lied in the articulation of this information on a site in Nivsta, a site that they had to choose for their innkeeper. There was no logical path, no method to get there. We could work meth meth uh, methodically and didactically within the conceptual locality of each reference model, but surrounding these islands was a sea of imagination and free will. No one was there to tell us what they thought they wanted, and no external necessity or problematic could provide us with a self-evident answer. New questions emerged, emerged as the proposals for our own inns progressed. How could we talk about our projects? How could we hand them over in a way that would let them stand on their own? We examined the documentary style of the Arte series Architecture and tried to imitate their soberly playful way of telling the story of each versus. The challenge was to divorce ourselves from the projects towards which we might feel a jealous ownership or a zealous reverence. We didn't want to turn the promotional commonplaces so prevalent, uh, on, we didn't want to turn to the promotional commonplaces so prevalent on popular architecture blogs. We wanted to place the inns on the table in front of us and turn around them, see them anew. Let's look at two of the inns. These projects are those of students in their third, which is the final year of our Bachelor of Science in Architecture program. Charles Actin Morin proposed the Inn of Lutegen for the Great Fetish. He chose a site that was slated to become uh, an eco neighborhood. The current metal scrapyard named Lutegen, in reference to the welding seam of the assembly of metalworking, would be cleaned up and the buildings demolished. The Inn for the Grand Fetish was envisioned as a monument to the memory of the former site, which had received and processed the metal waste of the community. He placed it directly on what was to become an important public square, an urban park for the neighborhood. The inn was, in its initial stages, probably for the person who can find poetry in the grit of a demolition and construction site, because he proposed to have it be there starting at demolition point where the guests would come in and sort of bear witness to this transformation. In contrast to the friendly material palette of wood and brick found and slightly imposed by the guide produced for the eco neighborhood, Charles chose to clad the inn with the corrugated steel salvage, salvaged from the existing structures on site. Metal workers or artists inspired by the scraps offered to the great fetish might use the studios of the inn's common spaces for creating something new. As the neighborhood begins to grow up around the inn, the clientele will look more like traveling repair people and maker types interested in repurposing or repairing household items discarded by the local residents who might trade an old toaster for a used bicycle. The aesthetics of the inn would evolve as the repurposed items are both put on display and integrated into the life of the residents and the experience of the visitors. The second um, project was recorded, uh, and so I'd like to share the video of the, 
the recording that Laura put together. It's in French, but with English subtitles. La maison des secrets. Une auberge, construite par Hermès, lui nomade et dieu des messages, à l'honneur de sa parède Estia, la déesse du foyer. Ancrée au cœur du parc de Gridobi encore, à l'enceinte de la ville de Nista située en Suède, la Maison des Secrets annonce le retour du couple Hermès-Estia, Mercure-Vesta, le messager au quai du C, et la Vesta la l'autre. Le parc de Great Obiangor se situe juste au nord de la ville de Nista, à l'est de la voie ferrée, en direction de Psala. Dans ce parc, on y trouve le marais de Trunsta, en plus d'un sanctuaire d'oiseaux qui est inconnu par de nombreux habitants de Loplan. Cet endroit est très enchanteur, de même que le poète Olaf Dunman avait écrit un poème intitulé Nivistavar en 1935, qui décrivait la biodiversité de ce parc. À l'ombre septentrionale, la dernière neige granuleuse de la crête fond sous les bouleaux et les épicéas de Boagin. Et dans la brise, sur le trun Starwan, inondé, deux cygnes blancs nagent ensemble. Colonne, roche, bombe, chaton porte le nom commun de statue ou le nom propre d'Estia. C'est ainsi, autour de ces pierres, que l'amant rencontre l'ennemi. Hermès construit le pavillon principal de son auberge, qui fera partie intégrante du paysage, autour de ce point fixe, qui s'apparente à la statue d'Estia. Son programme découle de l'idée où le savoir habite avec Estia et court en compagnie d'Hermès. C'est-à-dire, à, à l'intérieur de ce pavillon, on peut non seulement récolter le savoir d'Estia, mais aussi le faire voyager en échangeant avec les autres explorateurs par l'entremise des espaces communs. En d'autres mots, le pavillon principal de l'auberge d'Hermès tend la main à Estia afin qu'elle puisse transmettre son savoir du paysage aux explorateurs de Nusta. Les chambres, quant à elles, situées en périphérie du pavillon principal, révèlent la nature errante d'Hermès. Hermès messager apporte d'abord la clarté dans les textes et signes hermétiques, c'est-à-dire obscurs. Inspiré par ces mots, Hermès ingénieur développe le pavillon d'Estia en fonction de ce concept. Construit sous terre, il introduit la lumière sur des surfaces courtes afin de susciter le mouvement, l'exploration des lieux et ultimement la rencontre avec l'autre. À l'intérieur, on y retrouve la réception, le salon, le restaurant et les services. Chaque espace est ainsi éclairé par un ou plusieurs puits de lumière. Ce pavillon à la fois vestal et hermétique offre très peu de percées visuelles sur le paysage. La seule fenestration est celle qui donne accès à l'observatoire d'Estia. Cet espace extérieur, semi-protégé, enlace la statue d'Estia qui se situe au centre. L'observatoire agit également comme élément délimitant l'espace habitable par l'homme du paysage conservé dans son état naturel. Entre l'espace de réception et le salon se situe un escalier en spirale qui lui donne accès à une terrasse située en toiture. 
le jour. Celle-ci offre une différente perspective sur le paysage au loin. Tandis que le soir, elle devient un observatoire céleste, éclairé par les lucarnes. Au sud, les explorateurs entrent par un tunnel étroit qui lui mène à l'espace de réception. Une fois franchi, il n'y a plus de parcours prédéterminé. Les limites entre les espaces voûtés sont délibérément floues afin d'offrir la liberté à l'explorateur d'aller là où il le désire. Et puis finalement, par cette coupe, on remarque également comment la composition de la toiture offre au paysage la possibilité de se déployer selon un processus évolutif naturel et sans aucune barrière. La Maison des secrets offre aux explorateurs deux types de chambres selon trois emplacements différents. Le premier type est la chambre hermétique au caractère vestal qui peut soit se situer en hauteur ou en en relation avec la Terre. Le second type est la chambre vestale au caractère hermétique, qui elle se situe aux endroits les plus dégagés de la forêt. Au total, on y compte 17 chambres pouvant accueillir jusqu'à 62 visiteurs. Ici, dans la chambre hermétique, il faut penser à l'hermétisme étant un contenant dans lequel on y verse deux liquides et ceux-ci s'y mélangent. Dans ce type de chambre, Hermès s'y loge deux familles différentes et ainsi, les hasards favorisent qu'elles risquent de se croiser autour de l'arbre qui marque le centre. En plan, notons la quasi-symétrie de la cabine où chaque chambre, chauffée au bois, possède un lit double et deux lits superposés ainsi qu'une aire de vie. À l'extérieur, une toilette commune et un espace de rangement pour l'entretien ménager. La cabine la plus haute se situe à 8 mètres par-dessus le niveau du sol, tandis que la cabine en relation avec la Terre est plus facilement accessible pour tout type d'explorateur. Estia, la femme qui tisse auprès du foyer, marque le caractère vestal de cette chambre en y ajoutant un lit tissé à la main en plein centre. Celui-ci, parfois transpercé par les éléments du paysage, offre aux explorateurs un endroit propice aux échanges et à la contemplation. La chambre vestale est synonyme de pureté. On y accède par en dessous et à l'intérieur, on n'y retrouve qu'un seul lit situé au cœur de la pièce. Les murs, au caractère hermétique, amplifient ce sentiment de centralité. L'unique vocation de cet espace est donc le repos. En dessous se situe une plateforme habitable qui, elle, offre la possibilité aux explorateurs de communiquer avec le paysage terrestre. Tout comme la chambre hermétique et dans le même objectif que le pavillon d'Estia, la chambre vestale est construite sur pilotis afin d'exercer le moins de pression possible sur le paysage naturel, favorisant ainsi son évolution à travers le temps. On remarque également l'immense lucarne qui chapeaute la chambre. Le jour, cette dernière éclaire l'espace intérieur, et le soir, elle se transforme en un observatoire céleste plus intime que celui du pavillon d'Estia. Multiple voyageurs, le plus souvent égaré, Hermès errant trouve Estia, l'immobile, s'apparaît de toujours et se fond avec elle. Voilà l'histoire de la Maison des Secrets. Ne laissant pas plus de traces que sur un désert de sable pendant une tempête, cette auberge connecte des lieux séparés et ménage ainsi des espaces lisses. Plutôt que voyager, habiter va devenir le fondement vital de nos savoirs. On dit vivre vite avec Hermès, habiter, coucher, dormir, penser, enfin avec Estia.
Oops. Voilà. The, the next course I'd like to talk about is titled Une Maison, Ses Voix et Ses Visages, A House, Its Voices and Its Faces. It was an elective course I offered which adopted the format of a small studio. Seven students, five from our master program and two Erasmus students in our bachelor program attended this course in the fall of 2022. Here is the story of the house studio. In 1954, Le Corbusier published A Little House, Une Petite Maison, in the original French, a book that recounts the history of a house, Villa Le Lac, built by the architect as a retirement home for his parents in 1924 on the shores of Lake Geneva. A little book for a little house, the architect addresses the site, structural considerations, several architectural elements, and provides a glimpse of his spatial and conceptual reasoning. A Little House reads a bit like a fictional biography of Villa Le Lac. There is plenty of description, but the life of the house is presented in three episodes. Le Corbusier introduce, introduces the reader to the concept of the house, its plan, and the initial search for a site. A plan without a site? He writes, yes. In the second chapter, the reader is led through the house, discovering how Villa Le Lac embodies the architect's understanding of the site and his intentions behind its architecture. The ever-present and overpowering scenery on all sides, he writes, has a tiring effect in the long run. Have you noticed that under such conditions, no, one no longer sees? To lend significance to the scenery, one has to restrict it and give it proportion by taking a radical decision. The view must be blocked by walls, which are only pierced at certain strategic points. In the third, third section, the architect shares with the reader an episode in which the house is afflicted by an ailment. A rise in the water table is placing an upward thrust on the watertight cellar of, on the western side. A crack has appeared in the concrete. Solution, cover it with aluminum facing. Our question was, what if the book had been about a completely different house and for a different client? What if we forget for a moment about the fame of the original architect? What if we tried to respect the syntactical structure of the text and the general semantic intentions of Le Corbusier while doping the text with an entirely new meaning? We would not imitate the house, but rather the text and the illustrations to deliver it to the reader. What if seven iconic houses of the 20th century had been built by their architects for seven clients, fictional characters? You know several of them already now. What if Adalberto Libera had in the late 1930s built the Casa Malaparte not for Curto Malaparte, but for the Tierra Street, the troubadour of knowledge? What if Glenn Merkett's Magni House had been built in Australia for the early 80, in the early 80s for the great fetish? What if the Hominescent had decided in the early 1920s to ask Gerrit Rietveld to build the Schroeder House in Utrecht? What if Kisho Kurakawa had built, had, not, had built the capsule house for the Tanatocrat, the political strategist who lives by the motto that power is ultimately founded upon death? And what if Pantope, the global traveler, the cosmopolitan whose motto is go everywhere, decided to ask Toyo Ito to build him a pied à terre, his aluminum house, in Tokyo in the late 1990s? What if Miss van der Rohe had, in some odd time warp, built the Villa Tugendhat for Thumbelina, Petite Poussette? Or what if Le Récitant, the storyteller, had commissioned Alvar Atto's Villa Maria in 1939? We puzzled over another question. The character of Le Corbusier's parents is not shared with the reader. They remain implicit in the house and are featured very little in the book. How could we capture the life that our characters would breathe into their house? What would we hear around their tables? Whose voices would grace the presence of the alternate residents? And what would we hear them say? What would they talk about? How would particular topics mean a particular topos relative to the personality of a particular host? In order to find these voices, we use Nemo, a search engine that I'm currently developing that with a keyword search returns three sentence excerpts from texts in a series of corpora. The corpus of the voices of others breathes life into the body of the house, even if the voices would appear only on pages inserted into the book and would not enter the reauthoring verbatim. The little house presents both sketches and photos. How would the architect we impersonate communicate his or her ideas to the client? Which photos would replace each photo in the book? How could the graphic styles embody both the characters and their houses? And I'll share two of them with you. What I'm going to be doing is reading uh, English translations of the original French and select some of the voices of the dinner guests that are found at the same location as the excerpts. The first one is uh, Une Petite Scène, A Little Stage, Casa Malaparte for the Troubadour by Olivier Bonrussavat. 
Olivier saw the troubadour's Casa Malaparte as a little stage. It would not, as Le Corbusier wrote, welcome my father and mother in their old age after a life of hard work, but would, be, would, but would welcome the new dailies of the troubadour and his dramas during his life as a harlequin. The architect learns that the troubadour heard from Isabel Stengers that the ingredients are there, but we still need to learn how to arrange them to explore what dynamic chaos, if staged appropriately, could force us to do. To which Jane Jacobs added, in architecture as in literature or theater, it is the infinite richness of humanity's destiny that gives life and color to our environment. Bernard Stiegler, who chimed in following that, it's a staging device, every bit as fantastical as cinema. In a little house, Le Corbusier visits the roof of Villa de Lac. The little stage takes the reader to the roof of the Casa Malaparte. We climb up onto the roof, a pleasure known only to dinner guests gathered after a show. The podium forms the terrace stage, and with 20 or 30 meters to fall, sudden death. Street theater, roof theater, that is, an artistic sporting event that can withstand any kind of weather. Denis Ollier comments to his host, nothing, neither in the fall nor in the void is revealed, for the revelation of the void is only a means of falling further into absence. It is followed by these words, onward, always onward. What is the house's ailment? It was expected that something would happen. On l'avait laissé deviner, il allait se passer quelque chose, Le Corbusier wrote. Olivier continues in his reauthoring, don't forget that it's a film set without a black box. A strange affliction overcame the artist. He fell suddenly into a deep depression. The scenario playing out on the stage prevented all emancipation. But it was important to know what was the matter. Rehearsals, rehearsals. The little stage is caught in the script. The scenes become predictable. Hannah Arendt whispers, the process of fabrication that is limited to a single tool has a predictable end. It's from there, adds Jacques Rancière, that we can ask the question of the relationship between the ordinariness of work and artistic exceptionality. And Jean-François Lyotard, to add in passing, the limit can be crossed or broken, for it is precisely not a limit for the spirit. It would have to be there at the moment when it is no longer there. It would have to persist, different, no doubt, but repeated beyond this limit, for it is to be a limit of the spirit, and that still wouldn't be enough. One day we were told, the reauthoring continues, that the artist, artist dove from the height of the Capri Hills into the high seas, a strange path to inspiration. But Shakespeare stated that any actor dropped into a liquid is subject to an upward thrust equal to the weight of his discouragement. Olivier choos, chose, chooses to adapt the drawing style to one that recalls the sketches of a storyboard. The architect he is impersonating speaks to the troubadour in a language that they can share. The troubadour is not, only a, is not a film director, yet he is the symbolic, symbolic embodiment of impersonation, a harlequin. The architect speaks to this impersonation through a graphic language of cinema, cinema storyboarding, capturing the house, which is given a theatrical and cinematic embodiment in the reauthoring of a little house. Charlie Venger rewrites a little, une petite maison for the storyteller who will be occupying, le récitant, who will be occupying the Villa Maria. A little story, she calls it, une petite histoire. The storyteller, I'll remind you, is a paleoanthropologist whose motto is knowing is remembering, and remembering is recounting. Recounting is knowing. Where Le Corbusier begins with a former Roman route linking Sion, Lausanne, and Geneva, Charlie brings with, begins with a primordial soup, linking the DNA of cells to that of the Earth's flora and fauna. Since it all began millions of years ago, she wrote, the energy of the expanding universe has spread the heat of, of the singular event. Luckily, the sauna of the little story stayed warm and sheltered. Augustin Burke, we hear around the table, says to the storyteller, indeed, the universe, for the universe to take place as a result of the Big Bang, there must be nothing, otherwise there would be nothing. The place would already have been taken. It is not a question of ontology, added another guest, Jean-Luc Nancy. It is not about a single point of origin. And Jean-Hugues Barthélemy to add, Jean-Hugues Barthélemy to add, nothing prevents us from conceiving of this origin, because it would not be in time, not be in the past, but rather contain all instants past and to come. The house looks out upon the verdant terrain of the courtyard. Speaking of the use of vegetation around the villa, Charlie writes, or rewrites, I should say, have you noticed how one no longer considers nature? In order for nature to matter, we must personify it, dimension it by a radical decision, 
decenter humanity by elevating the universality of that which exists and by revealing it at strategic points, interrupting our anthropocentrism. The main staircase with, with its alignment of several small trunks brings the forest inside. Georges Canquillem, standing at the foot of the stair with Deleuze and the storyteller, mused over the dramatic conflict between the organic idea of the world and the idea of a universe decentered relative to the privileged center of reference of the ancient world of the living and of man. Gilles Deleuze, examining the series of vertical elements, adds, no series enjoys a privilege over the other. None possesses the identity of a model, none the resemblance of a copy. And a social scientist who interjects in passing, this move of decentering requires that we foreground assumptions that precede thinking with theory and how what we propose is different in, an, in every way. Where Le Corbusier presents us with the garden where Villa de Lac's flora awakes, Charlie offers the reader Villa Maria's library where the voices of the learn, learned are awakening. Knowledge is being shared once again, she writes. Transgenerational communication has covered the essentials. It's very dense. As an encyclopedia, the merging, the emerging sciences and the enlightenment. As a novel, the stories of talented authors and subjects. The garden of remembrance, she writes. Evolving on its own, in step with the sciences, discovering contradictions, and thinkers carrying forth new theories. After nearly 80 years, we read, the entrance bears the crossings and, passwork, and patchworks of theories, transformations, adaptations, and nuances of the story. Audience, in 1939, this hall was naked as a jailbird. Only a neighbor whose curiosity got the best of him would show his face at the end of the hall. Knowledge evolves and the forest thickens. The sciences are temporary. Theories come a long way. In this entry, the storyteller hears the voice of Jane Jacobs. They'll meet characters they might never meet elsewhere and perhaps never forget. And Foucault, who is there as well, who says, if not also because the brevity of a line reflects the simple image of a short life, the crossing of two folds, the meeting of an obstacle, the rise of a man to success. It's at the crossroads, interjects Daniel Payot, that he raises himself up at the point where all knowledge converges. Where we change our system of transport, adds Kevin Lynch, places of passage from one structure to another. What ailment befalls the Villa Maria, the little story, novelty, says Charlie, one could have guessed something would happen. We're told time and again that children's playrooms are changing at a furious pace. Modifications are updated at the slightest effort. We're amazed to discover that the children's, rooms, that the children's room placed in the central bay, the play module, is a playground for new wordings, new phrasings. The storyteller inspected the scene with several guests. Without birth, we wouldn't know what novelty was, says Emmanuel Ecocha. Birth makes us truly aware of the newness that is proper to action. On our end, who jumps in again, the fact that the word world renews itself daily by virtue of the phenomenon of birth and the spontaneity of newcomers, and that is constantly drawn into unpredictable novelty, stands in the way of the possibility of defining and recognizing the future. Outside the concept of change, chimes in again Jean-Luc Nancy, there is simply no concept of something, because then there would be either birth or the disappearance of substance, which cannot take place in time, but rather exclusively as time itself. Charlie continues in her rewriting, fixed houses with independent narratives built on absolute and therefore unalterable foundations periodi periodically crack in their use, Disfatis dissatisfactions that alert no one. The constants of time, however, are barely disturbed. Whereas the adventures of everyday moments form bad habits, here we're building a narrative, a flexible story framework on the foundation. But to, avoid but to avoid systematically rejecting the novelties of the future, she can, continues to write, which is what I'm translating from here. We, we offered the possible convenience of an innovation of the presence, and so it was told. Charlie impersonates an architect who communicates with the storyteller through collage. Her style of ducks in space, what the storyteller would have, would, have, would have to unfold in time, picking a point in the synchronicity of the visual and following a meandering path asynchronously. This vector in my architectural studios and courses will continue to develop as I add functionality to the search engine Nemo. Nemo in its current form allows for, for full text search in three French corpuses, 104,565 articles hosted by the Erudit platform of French language academic journals. 
1,220 books sourced from the University of Quebec and Chicoutimi's Classics of the Social Sciences, and 383 books and articles that I've gathered. In, in English, um, Nemo allows for full text searching within 1,498 books of the ETH's Xenoteca, 1,233 books from my own library, and 629 articles published in the Architecture Journal Log. In 2021, at the time of the Verdsu Studio, I had the Kapora with Python scripts on my own machine. Each student received a file containing between 50 and 100 three-sentence excerpts, where one of the characters was mentioned in the 52 books and articles written by Nisha Ser contained in the corpus at the time. In the summer of 2022, I hired a student assistant to build a web application from the code that I'd written in Python. The house, small studio, was the first time that students searched on their own using Nemo. The search for the voices that one would be likely to hear in the house was guided by the character of the new resident and their research on the iconic 20th century house. Each student had to invent the topics that would guide their choice of keywords in Nemo. They built up their own corpus of the voices of potential dinner, dinner guests, les voix des convives, which I asked them to associate first with the photos they were gathering prior to uh, returning to their authoring of the new edition of A Little House. Reworking an existing text in this way is along with translation, one of the exercises of imitation used in the classical education of antiquity for learning how both to write and how to think through writing. Sharon Crowley and Deborah Hahi call this inhabiting through practice. Inhabiting is less about reaching into the depths of oneself than looking at the way others dwell in and through the written, written word. Imitation requires judgment. It is, not only about, it is not about copying a single model. Like Zeuxis, who called for several beautiful women to serve as models for his painting of Helen of Troy, it is not about matching the likeness of one reference, but as Quintilian might say, it's about keeping a number of excellences before the eyes so that different qualities from different authors may impress themselves on our minds. Carol Westfall reminds us, that in reminds us in Architecture, Liberty, and the Civic Order that models embody something that is latent to them and not readily apparent. In conclusion, there is a connection that is not, I think, fortuitous between imitation that learns to inhabit through practice and artificial intelligence. As we have learned how we learn, we have learned to externalize our models of, of learning into algorithmic instruments. Working with large corpuses and machine learning algorithms is akin to holding many excellences before our eyes, where what is excellent is what seems to stand firm, if, even if only locally, even if only in a local region of a corpus of interest. In the two courses I presented, the AI functions of Nemo are not really part of the exercises. In the Verdsu studio, the words of Michel Serre were taken as textual fragments indexing the personality of the innkeepers. In the house studio, the voices of the residents' guests were articulated as fragments of a spirit of the house. In both instances, the abundance of what can be sourced provides elements that we can articulate through a judgment and reasoning that is mostly our own, but that we also pick up and borrow from, from others. I'm currently thinking of this as learning to give a body to that which the possible mimetic models held before the eyes of the machine can only embody indexically. Thank you. Now, uh, pose some questions. Maybe uh, if I can take the liberty to ask the first one. Um, I'm very impressed uh, with, with how you're doing, and it's clear for me that you are informing these models, that, that you're informing practically the design of the students and thinking of the, the, the students with the large corpus of data that you uh, gathered yourself and that from the models that you created. Uh, I would just like to know a little bit more about, is there kind of an inter intermediate stage that you haven't showed us in between in between these texts and images that, you, that the your students are using and the final design in one of their uh, in, in one of their design projects mm -hmm. I mean in the first studio it's definitely um, the sort of intermediate um, critiques the intermediate reviews we have where the students were asked to start to pick up the citations. So I told you they received anywhere between 50 and 100 uh, citations of the, the characters. So Laura, uh, Tito Laura Bitae, she received 50 to 100 excerpts from books written by Michel Serre, uh, where the, the name Her Hermès appeared at least once. And she also asked them afterwards for 
the ones referring to Hestia, because Hestia was a figure that was often presented with Hermes. So she asked for that, and the first critique was the students would start to tell us what it is they were learning about and understanding uh, from the citations they were given about the, 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 in, about the, um, uh, about the innkeepers. So that was the, the first initial stage. And we sort of, I'd, I'd say it's not about being right or, or correct, but it's more about just seeing how it kind of starts to embody a, a persona that we are, see them beginning to understand. Because of course, from all these citations, you can't say, OK, this is exactly who uh, the troubadour of knowledge is. This is exactly who um, the, um, uh, the grand fetiche is. So it's interesting to sort of build up indexes with the citations. And they presented that to myself and to jury members in uh, one, or two, one or two of our critiques. And in the second one, what I proposed in the, in the Maison uh, small studio, what I proposed was that what I showed you here with the, cor the corpora. Oops. I think I'm still sharing my screen. If you can see. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so they had to start picking up, uh, and they would present what the drawings that they were, either the drawings they were starting, so this is the, the Schroeder house, uh, and then the images of the house, and to try to imagine what would be discussed if the, if the new resident with his dinner guests were standing looking at this, at the house from this angle, or looking, walking up the stairs of the Casa Malaparte at this point. And then they started sort of beginning to pick. And that was a lot of discussion with the students about, so what are the keywords? What are the topics that you think they're going to bring up? And that, that in itself was, a, was one of our preliminary reviews. But this course, the advantage of this one was that because it was, uh, I presented it as a course that was three credit hours, I was able to kind of step out of the needing to do the design project, which if it had been a six credit studio, I would have been sort of subjected, well, subjected, that's not very a kind word, but sometimes it is subjected to the accreditation criteria for, for studios. So, um, which is why you saw in the, but I, I thought, thought it was interesting, interesting challenge in the, the Veiltu studio that the students really are, are required to start to design building uh, construction details in this. So the narrative has to kind of work out from the level of choosing the site to uh, the point of um, what, what building details are they going to show us. I hope that answers a little bit the question. Yes, Carla. Certainly there was a phase of having to learn how to search in Nemo. Right, because getting the keywords, learning when you can use and, what you use or for. So I'm thinking, well, thank you so much for the presentation. And I'm thinking about precedent analysis. Mm -hmm. And this becoming a tool that is very helpful for students to do kind of this previous work before they actually go into their design strategies. So I was thinking, usually, like, I will just talk about what I do and see how you think about it. So. Mm -hmm. When, I, when I'm doing precedent analysis, I try to have like a pool of different designer or architectural projects. And I see that your pool of variation is on text. And then, then you see at one project at a time. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, have you considered this becoming this tool for precedent analysis? And why will you choose to be very rich on text and very punctual on the architecture? Mm -hmm. I think. So I don't always give the studio exactly the same way as the Veritas studio, although I keep coming back to it from, you know, as we semester after semester, we learn certain things, certain things work, certain things we want to try to do differently. Um, I think that the, the main um, vector through the studio is, is very much the narrative that they start to develop. And the precedent, the existing buildings come in either as buildings they found on site or as ones there looking at for different aspects of the project. So like I showed you with the Verzu studio, the, that we were going into detail for construction details. And we were going into Arc Daily for more programmatic. Because in Arc Daily, I felt kind of like I could open them, I could allow them to open up to kind of the large space of, of Arc Daily, where what we were interested in was more programmatic organization and spatial organization than, uh, let's say, the, a kind of architectural canon um, that we might say, you should imitate this particular building. That, that, that that was more what we did in the in the maison 
studio, the second one I presented, where it was really about inhabiting, inhabiting the text, but they had to learn a lot about the house that they were going to be sort of inhabiting the uh, Corbusier's text, Le Corbusier's text with. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> Precedent analysis is such a funny, is such a funny thing because it seems, I don't know how, how, how you perceive it, but it seems relatively straightforward when someone says, oh, now we're gonna do a precedent analysis and the students kind of march on their way as if they've had this very clear method. But I feel like um, it's about the way I see, it's about seeing what, it's about dealing with, with heritage in a way, not in the sense of like a preservation in that, but I mean like, what is it, that the world already can offer us. And that's why I see them as kind of potential mimetic models, which gives them a kind of power as well that we have to, I think, account for because the student can get also, anyone can get sucked in kind of to the model. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for your presentation. So I, I was wondering, um, so because at the beginning I thought uh, that these different characters from Michel Serre, now that it would be kind of clients, but the more you presented it, um, I was thinking whether they're not masks in really in the sense of this kind of personares or this kind of sounding devices, which is also a bit like a, like a lens through which to look at this president, which is not really, uh, perhaps, yeah, as you were saying, not really an analysis, but a way to, to yeah, to sound this architecture mm -hmm. through the uh, consciousness that is there in these masks. And then therefore, Perhaps, I don't know if they could be something like these uh, masks of the genius lo Loki that uh, you wrote mm -hmm. about in an article, no? Um, so this would be one of the questions and then the other a bit uh, on, a, on another note. Um, so since you are working mostly uh, in French, mm -hmm. um, so yesterday we had the question about uh, large language models and the predominance of English in it. So. Would, uh, would working, if, did you notice anything, let's say, particular, or was it less effective in French, or I don't know, like, would it, what, did, did this change anything co compared to, let's say, the, the dominance of English in this large language, language, mm -hmm. language model? Well, to the first question, yeah, I, I think we can think of them as a mask, and I think that's what makes them, so in the brief, it's easier to, to tell the story to the students that it's a client, because if you tell them it's a mask, then it's, then it becomes in equip cryptic and perhaps it, where you didn't want to put the cryptic aspect of the studio. But yeah, I think, I think that's what I like about the, the characters is that they are not, they come with a kind of indexicality. So yeah, they're a mask. They allow a kind of sounding through. And I think that what they sound through, so this personare, is, uh, is a kind of um, diffraction, I guess if we think of it in terms of light, of the, or a filtering of the human condition. That's how I see Ser using them, as kind of fragments of the human condition. So everyone, you could say probably that every bit of humanity is, is comprised indirectly by the mask of each of these, these characters, which is what I think allows them to become very rich references without being like, oh, I know that person. Like, and then it becomes reduced to either an empathic relationship you have with someone in particular, or a kind of generic, almost socio-demographic, sociological, statistical kind of idea that, oh, that must be a, a retired person, therefore they ba -ba 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 need all of these things. So I think it helps keep a sort of uh, distant, an encoding relative to a different, a richer form of kind of encoding, I think, than, than uh, the th kind of theoretical model that we might have of, of who someone, who this potential client might be, a potential client that we often don't know as architects, because um, sometimes who's, what I mean is who's commissioning the building is not necessarily the person who will be living in the building or frequenting the building. So the second question, I don't know if I can respond well to that because uh, I'm working with, the text corpuses I'm working with are not at the moment communicating with each other. So they are, um, when one searches in Nemo, they search within a single language and it makes a difference how you search. But in terms of natural, natural language processing tools, it's certainly not, we can deal with French, just like we can deal with English. So, and I think if I were to have them, the next step of the process which I, um, of NEMO, which I recently um, uh, submitted a grant for, is to allow the corpuses to talk to each other so that one can, one can um, say, oh, this text is interesting who are its friends in another corpus. And I want the corpus 
to be either in English or in French, which will require a kind of translation moment between, I don't know if uh, probably other people have dealt with this, that you then have to decide, well, is the English stuff getting translated to French for the, this kind of vect vectorial bridge, or is it going to be the, the French to English? So it becomes, for me, it's kind of a technical question of which, what do I have more of and what's, is it a cost to do it? The idea of considering this large language English model, it's very interesting. And I think this is something that I've never, like, I've never even said it out loud. And I think this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Because the, um, what you're having always, there is this translator in any language that you have, right? So you have these lar large language English models. You have all of these different culturally loaded, different ways of communicating through language. And then you have this one translator that I think we are all using when you're using large language models. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting research question about what is this translator role within this communication that you're going to have eventually. Mm -hmm. Not only saying that you're going to have text talking to text, but then who, what's the role of this translator and what do you want this translator to do and be? Mm -hmm. Because then you know you have this large language model, which is the <clears throat> uh, English large language model, which is robust, beautiful, a lot, common knowledge. But then you also have another actor into this whole plane of communicating with books, which is a translator. What is that translator? Can you have different translators and see if they are really in, like, what are, they, do they change the final outcome? I think, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just I'm speaking out loud. Maybe mm -hmm. this is not a question, but I just very, got very excited with this because a lot of people are trying to say, um, with this prompt engineering and language, they are trying to prompt the uh, generators with different languages the same sentence, and then they are getting different outputs. But I'm not very sure if the different outputs is because of different languages, but it's more because that the translator is just like getting it something differently. Mm. And then if you do the same exercise with search engines, which they are really, uh, you know, like they are not generating, but they are parsing or sorting things out. You have, you do have a different output when you use different languages. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. maybe this is, I don't know. How do you feel about this? Hmm. Have you thought about, you know, translator well, as being the one of the main actors within this language communication? Well, speaking from what I'm working on, I would say that the translator, the translation moment is kind of latent in how one can then say this text is similar to this other text. So Nemo, so. Nemo would not, um, would not, it's not a large language model. So the idea is not that you can, the, it's, it's basically just like a search engine that is not, it's not a chat, jot, chat bot. So it wouldn't produce itself text. So when, this, when someone who searches in it finds a text of interest and they want to find other similar texts, if the similar texts are in a different language, then the decision has already been made. Which, what was the language that with the, natural language processing tools was allowed, was able to, you know, put a, a common, create a common kind of denomination for all of the texts in that vectoral, vectoral space, <laughs> and uh, then get them to speak to each other. And the students, I mean, this is part of going back to the exercises of, of, of imitation, is translation is also a form of inhabiting through practice. So I like the fact that the students have to translate. I like, but I don't know if, if I like that I like, because it took a lot of time translating what I presented to you today of their work, because that's complicated. That is complicated. I have to inhabit also their texts if I want to share it with you in English. So that, and I think they are, they are forced to do that when they start getting people from different, that are writing in different languages to speak to each other about a common topic. Yeah. But it, will, will that sort of translation, will the inhabiting of the text be something that's on the side of the machine? I don't, I don't know if in my work that's become a, a critical issue yet. That's an interesting question. Thanks. Yes, Augustino. You felt uh, <laughs> I mentioned you and looked at you. Yeah, it's very nice to see um, how the search engine and this kind of corpus starts to play with the <clears throat> both 
the precedents that the students are working with and then how it starts influencing on the way how they speak about the, the building. And if I understood correctly, also the first project that you showed was a design project that was also based on a similar process. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, was there ever, a, um, did you ever try to go with the actual model or the design that the students built back to the search engine? Is that like a exercise that students ever attempted in finding other ways of speaking about their design so that the writings, they're not reflective of a precedent, but they also start to become projective of how to speak of one's own design? Yes. Last semester, I had the students um, who were designing um, what they did last semester was they designed cultural spaces that were to host um, the, what Quebec has, they're called the délégation uh, du Québec. So it's, Quebec operates almost like a semi-country where it has delegations that are like cons consular and cultural um, attaches in different parts of the world. And they have an office in Boston. And the idea was that they would, we would be, offering them a place where the culture of, where people from New England and people from basically New France would kind of meet in Boston around particular aspects of the, the interests of the, of the delegation. And uh, the students, the cl our, our sort of host or mécène was uh, the Le Tier Instruit, which was, I gave him his second, um, second uh, nickname, the Homo Pontifex. So the, the who bridges, the, the bridging as, as, as a kind of uh, aspect of our humanity. And um, in that case, the text was not something that was as present at the beginning, but came later as the students start to, they were designing, they had to start thinking about that, again, that, that kind of cultural multi-use space, what would they do with it? It's not supposed to be completely generic or completely empty, but they have to give kind of a color to it. And so then, Nemo became part of, uh, part of discovering the voices of the people who would be frequenting, who the homo pontifex would welcome into this place where he was actually hosting, uh, on the one hand, New England and sort of New France in, the, in a meeting place. So I don't know if that really changed. It certainly uh, changes the way we talk about the project with the students, because then we can say, ah, well, maybe, maybe it's a kind of space that, that might um, that might have might use lighting differently. That might be have um, a different relationship with the street, and maybe that means that the whole thing will kind of be rearticulated. And that's that's something that even though we have a 15-week semester, it's still something that you're sprinting all the time with that, which is also good for the students. A lot of decisions get made kind of with uh, with an intuition that we it's partially emotional and partially I'd say intellectual, but yeah. It certainly makes for interesting conversations because it allows to put ideas in texts. It allows to bring ideas for discussion that are the words of others. And therefore, it's, we can kind of speak on a middle, on something that's on the table. And it's not, I don't have to, if we critique during our discussion some of the ideas that are being placed on the table, we're talking about those ideas and not a kind of personal um, appropriation that the, the student has with their, where it's my project and this is how I want it to be and it can be any way I want it to be. And, so that, that really, that helps create, again, a kind of masking filter, I'd say, to our discussions. Hello. Hello, I guess. Can you hear me? Ah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Michael. I haven't seen these projects uh, from you in a while, and they they look fantastic. I really, I really enjoy this uh, the 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 two kind of projects that you showed, and I I found it really great that you can just take these kind of formats of the documentaries of the Arte documentaries. I mean, I still think they're some of the best kind of documentaries on buildings ever made, and I like them very much. And that you can just take them and deploy them to a different kind of project. But then I was thinking, just because the the through Hermes, through Tambelina, the the kind of mythological narratives still keep coming back up again and again, and their names are mentioned. So these figures are mentioned over and over again. They acquire a kind of fairy tale like 
uh, character. I'm just wondering what would be <laughs> what would be your reaction if I were to call these projects like a fairy tale uh, architecture building exercise. That's kind mm -hmm. of what would you think about that? You know, because I kind of I really like it because even the 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 way the models are built, they're super precise and mm. and uh, always taken as miniatures, mm. and then little characters that are standing around. You know, that's just the 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 kind of genre of mm -hmm. uh, imagery that it falls into. Yeah, I think so. The 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 aesthetics of the projects and of the videos, uh, I, I usually leave up to the students. So I don't have time in this course to introduce any particular new tools of representation or I can't really bring them into a whole new way of working. They, I kind of have to let them show what they're able to do with what they've learned. So I think sometimes it could come off as fairy tale. I think there's kind of, uh, there are ones that are darker so uh, and sinister. So the student who um, reworked the little house, a little house for, uh, the, for the Tanatocrat, uh, the capsule house of uh, Kurokawa. That one was much darker. In fact, I was going to present you that one, but I thought it would weigh so much on, our, on, on, the, on the talk that it would be too dark, actually, to share, uh, because there's kind of a moment of, 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 a, of a kind of threat and, and of murder and of the disappearance of a body. And, and uh, it all worked well with the text, but I thought if I shared that one with you, it's going to be a little bit too heavy. So I think it really depends on how the, the student embraces the character. I think if you have a sort of a love story of Hermes just stumbling upon Hestia in this, in this marshland in, in Sweden, it certainly sounds a lot more, it comes, it has a fairy tale aspect that might be different if the Tanatocrat is awakening because the world is again at war and now he needs a place to live because he has business. He has business with the world, basically. So. The, and I like that the students can pick up and develop themselves the angle kind of of the of the genre. So I try to make it not. I try to keep it from becoming becoming so heavy. Let's say there's so much gravity, there's no more grace in it. So that's always a challenge. But sometimes the filters that they work through, like the story of the in petite maison, help keep things. Uh, they keep them light. They pick them back up again. I don't really, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. I, I don't know if I could target a genre like the question Nicole no, asked. Uh, asked uh, just because it was, just because the, the, the initial characters are so mythologically charged, mm -hmm. you know, the, this, is, this is what I was thinking, that once they keep uh, remaining at this level of mythology, then they end up being uh, fairy tales, you know? Mm -hmm. So they aren't embodied by characters that are real in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, Ricardo was asking something similar with the mask. I, I'm not sure, but uh, this kind of embodiment of Hermes in a character that we could relate to somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, as a person who would live yeah. uh, within within these uh, these these buildings that are designed. That that so that's why I'm calling them fairy tales because it's uh, it's mm -hmm. very hard to project oneself as a resident of these buildings, mm -hmm. because we know that this is the house of Hermes, so this is a temple mm -hmm. rather than uh, uh, a house. Yep, yep. Yeah. I can only agree and say that at the moment, I think I like the fairy tale aspect. So we'll see where right. it goes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great, thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Looks like. Huh?